Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome again to uh, the Deep Learning for Science School. This is the fourth week of our webinar webinar series this year. Um, I'm very pleased to have uh, Kustav Sinha today to give us a lecture on reproducibility and machine learning. Um, Kustav is a PhD candidate at Mag McGill University. He is um, working with uh, Joel Pinou and William Hamilton and is currently a research uh, intern at Facebook AI. Gustav has um, his primary interest is in advancing logical generalization capabilities of neural models in discrete domains, such as language and graphs. He's also involved in organizing the annual machine learning reproducibility channel, uh, challenge. Um, and he's serving as a reproducibility co-chair at NeurIPS 2019 and 2020. Gustav, I'll give you the floor. Thank you so much for the nice introduction, Mustafa. Um, yeah, so welcome to the talk. So basically in this talk, I will go over uh, like four different agendas. So uh, basically first I will talk about why do we need reproducibility in science, especially in machine learning. Then I want to talk about like the case study to need, need the reproducibility. So I will go over like certain findings that came up in the literature recently. Then I will talk about what is the machine learning community doing about it? Like what are the steps that we as a community are taking about reproducibility? And then finally, I will talk in depth about how you can perform reproducible research. So yeah, so basically a brief background about me, Mustafa already gave, like I'm a PhD student at McGill University and Mila, and I'm a intern at Facebook AI. And I've been like running reproducibility challenges for the last three years. So what is reproducibility? Now reproducibility refers to the ability of the researcher to duplicate the results in a prior study using the same materials as were used by the original investigator. Now reproducibility, replicability, robustness, like these are different terms which are kindly, kind of like used in different contexts. And there has been like a recent debate on the exact definitions of these different terms. So just for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to like uh, set up a definition. May, this definition may not be like uh, kind of like well accepted basically because there are certain things that overlap. So reproduce, by reproducible, I mean that if you use the same code and same data given by the authors, if you get the same results, then that is reproducible. Whereas robust is when you use the, a different code, but on the same data, that is what we are looking for at robustness. Whereas replicability is using the same code, but on a different set of data. And if you have both of them different, but you still get the same uh, claims of a particular paper, then that is like the highest level of reproducibility that is uh, generalization. So now taking these uh, definitions into account, what is the crisis that we are facing? So in uh, Nature published a nice report in 2016 by M. Baker on reproducibility crisis in science. So when asked people, so this is basically a, like a set of people with different domains in science. So not only like machine learning. So uh, basically 52% of the respondents re uh, like replied with, yes, we are facing a significant crisis and 38% responded that, yes, we are facing a slight crisis. Now, if we look at the domains that are involved, so chemistry and biology come up like the top two domains where they face a lot of reproducibility crisis. Now, looking at this, we might feel safe that, okay, computer science doesn't probably have that much reproducibility crisis, but that is not the case. Although in computer science, we can actually do a bit more about the reproducibility crisis. So basically, let's talk about certain findings in reproducibility uh, in, uh, in basically in machine learning. So reproducibility should be easy, right? At least for us computer scientists. We have the same code, we have the same amount of data, we might also have the same amount of computation and then you should get the same result, right? Now, seems like it's not the same case. So last year uh, in Europe's 2019, Edward Raff published a paper. So this paper, uh, a step toward quantifying independently reproducible machine learning research. In this paper, he tried to reproduce 255 papers, which were published from 1984 to 2017. 
And then he found out that 63.5% of the papers were reproducible and the rest were not. Now, he further went on to reproduce 85% of the result where after getting assistance from the original authors compared to 4% when the authors didn't re respond. So he only could reproduce 4% of the papers without having any author uh, like suggestions. So he came up with some significant factors which affect reproducibility. That includes uh, pseudocode. So the papers that he reproduced like basically had all code uh, available, but that is not always the case in case of machine learning research these days because of uh, several companies having like their proprietary use of code. So he mentioned that pseudocode, hyperparameters, readability, especially in equations and tables, and especially the amount of compute that is needed these are kind of like very significant factors affecting the reproducibility. Now, there are certain uh, limitations of this work. So this work was primarily done by one author and over the span of five years. So that might introduce certain biases in the study, but still this is a very significant study which shows that there is the issue in reproducibility in machine learning research. Now, if we dive a bit deep in several subfields of machine learning, let us talk about the computer vision subfield. Now, this is one field where people tend to think less about reproducibility because they like the usual notion is that, okay, whatever we are doing should be reproducible because it's the same data set, it's the same training pipeline. And essentially, uh, people in vision use uh, model architectures such as ResNet uh, or DenseNet, which are like deep uh, architectures to give you like a uh, pretty good performance performance on a large set of standard data sets. But there has been like several works showing that reproducibility is still a big issue. So uh, Xavier Boutelier published this paper, Unreproducible Research is Reproducible last year. So in this paper, he shows that if you vary the seeds of different models, the like different models have different variation in the errors. So here in the x-axis, this is the model error. And in the y-axis, you should see two representative data sets. The MNIST data set is a small data set compared to CIFAR 100, which is a larger data set, where MNIST is the data set of handwritten images and CIFAR is like a large data set of different objects. Now, we see that even it, like in the small data set, the, like the variation in seed is really uh, like important. And that is really a big issue in the smaller data sets. Whereas in bigger data sets, the variation is still there, but it's still not that uh, that prone to it, but certain models are like, for example, ResNet 101 is super prone to different uh, variations of seed. So the conclusion of the paper was that single initialization seed is brittle because most of the papers that are reported right now are just reported with only one seed. So a better uh, like evaluation for a given model would be to evaluate on at least n number of seeds, but there is also like no consensus right now. What would n be? Let's talk about another subfield. So this is generative adversarial networks, which have been like super popular area of research in machine learning over the last four or five years since its inception. We have seen a lot of papers being published in it. And there's a lot of like research coming up in devising different uh, GANs where GANs have become so good that they can generate realistic images to realistic videos these days. But even GANs suffer from this problem. So in 2017, there came up a paper known as Are GANs Created Equal? In that paper, uh, authors showed that basically uh, they ran a hyperparameter search on 100 different hyperparameter samples per model. And they show that there's a large variation in the results. And that shows that how uh, brittle these models are. Like if the hyperparameter searches like give us this bigger range, then there is that we need to basically report this. And if we are not reporting it, then we are not uh, like investigating truly on what is the model's performance. So no model was shown as significantly stable than the other. Now, this raises the question of limited computation budget. So if you are, a re if you are let's say, a university student, you do not have the budget to actually learn, like run 100 hyperparameter searches. So you will basically just run like quite a few number of samples and then you will get certain result. But then your result could become like different if you run on a large set of hyperparameters. So that's why discussing the best code given by your model should always be 
uh, used alongside how many seeds that you're running. And we should always try to report faithfully on the distribution of your scores rather than a single score. Now, let's talk about another field which is very prone to reproducibility issues. So this is reinforcement learning, where the idea is that an agent learns to interact with the environment by trial and error, by receiving sparse feedback, and with experience it improves in real time. And reinforcement learning has been used in a lot of uh, real life, uh, like real life problems, starting from robotics to even financial trading. So we, but when we look a bit deeper into reinforcement learning, so there has been a seminal paper which was released in 2017, which says deep reinforcement learning that matters. And in this paper, they show that most of the reinforcement learning algorithms suffer from this problem. When you change the algorithm uh, with different seeds, or when you run the algorithm with different hyperparameter, you get vastly different results. So for an example, like taking some uh, stuff out from the paper, if you take a, like a model known as TRPO, and this TRPO essentially has uh, like a lot of uh, different implementations available online. So if you take those implementations, you might end up finding that none of those implementations give you the same results on the same data set. So that, that is really concerning, especially in case of reinforcement learning. And people have shown uh, that different results vary a lot with different hyperparameter choices. So these are super, super sensitive. And if we look a little bit closer, let's say we take the same algorithm, we take the same code, we take the same hyperparameters, but we just vary the seeds. Even then the expected reward achieved by these models differ. And if that expected model, uh, like the reward differs, then what should one do? Like uh, basically if I propose a model, then you can come up with a different seed saying that that model doesn't work. So how many trials that we should do? So in these experiments, uh, when people report, the number of trials is also not standardized. Some uh, people report like five trials, like taking five seeds, while as some people report like two to three trials. So this also needs to be standardized. Another thing is the baseline. So this happens not only in reinforcement learning, but in general machine learning as well. People tend to underreport their baselines. So that basically uh, you want to show that, okay, my model is superior than the baseline. So people do not take care of them and people just report baselines by copying from another, another paper, which when if you like evaluate on different baselines, then you might see that the baseline might be beating your model. So there is like a strong positive bias that's happening. So basically coming from fair comparisons, we talk about robust conclusion. So basically we see that different methods have distinct set of hyperparameters. Different methods also exhibit variable sensitivity to hyperparameters. And what is the best method is often depends on the data and the compute budget available. Okay. so what are we doing about it? So these are all the problems that are uh, plaguing like machine learning research. But now I want to talk about some of the concrete steps that we are taking as a community. So first we talk about the open science movement. So the open science movement is not specific to machine learning. It's a much more general movement, which says that open science uh, is transparent and accessible knowledge that is shared and developed through collaborative networks. So that means that if you uh, care about reproducible research, you should also care about open science because that's when the science is well disseminated among people. So there exists a journal for reproducibility and uh, I want to talk about that journal first. So since the issue of reproducibility is so important, the ReScience journal was set up and this journal is a much more uh, generic journal. So this doesn't necessarily focus on machine learning only, but it focuses on any and all types of computational study be it uh, computational neuroscience to computational medicine and so on. And people can submit the reproducibility reports of published papers in this journal. Now this journal also has an extensive review process. So uh, your re reproduced work will be reviewed by a set of editors. And uh, from machine learning community, the annual reproducibility challenge reports are also published in this journal. So this journal is quite uh, cool. So it has like open reviewing on GitHub. That means that it doesn't have like single blind or double blind reviewing, unfortunately, but still you can submit uh, any work that you 
wish to replicate and reproduce, and then you can do a thorough analysis on that. And there is a large team of editors for rolling review over the year. So this journal essentially exists to give a nice incentive for people to work on reproducibility. Now let's talk about checklists. So this is more specific in terms of machine learning research. So my supervisor, Joel Pinu, like introduced the machine learning reproducibility checklist in 2018. This checklist is supposed to be like a set of uh, like items that you should check while you are submitting your paper. Now this checklist doesn't need to be exhaustive. These are just like a generic guidelines. And the, and the next version of this checklist were, was actually deployed during the review process of New Rips 2019, where the reviewers had access to the responses of these checklists. And from now on, reviewers in New Rips, as well as in ICML, they also have access to the answers of this reproducibility checklist. Now, uh, this, okay, I have a question which says, is there a link to the slides? Uh, the, the link is already uh, shared in Slack. Um, yeah, so when I talk about this checklist, so these are like part of New Rips, ICML and iClear submission guidelines. And if you look into this checklist, you will have like uh, th uh, different sections for reporting model uh, algorithms, theoretical claims, how to report your data sets, how to report your code bases, and uh, what to include in your like figures and tables and so on. So this checklist is essentially, is kind of like a guideline for you to follow. And we basically did a lot of study on the, on the reports of this checklist. So what people uh, did during uh, initial submission and camera ready submission in terms of New Rips 2019. So we collected those responses and we did an analysis. So most of the like items that we are primarily interested in. So if you look at uh, like link to code, like link to code was uh, not available during initial submission while the link to code was more available during camera ready. So this is due to the code submission policies that were enforced in New Rips 2019, so which I will be talking about next. But one cool finding from this reproducibility checklist, or I can say a surprising finding, is that 36 papers of, uh, like 36% of pap uh, papers judge error bars are applicable to their results, while 87% see clear value in defining the metrics and statistics used. So that is kind of like if 87% uh, if if see there is the value of the defining the metrics, then 87% should also like find uh, mentioning error bars as applicable. But this is where we basically need to improve as a community because we need to do much more uh, stringent statistical validity of our uh, models. Now, there's also uh, some effect of the code submission policies. So basically like New Rips 2019 enforced that code should be submitted, but it was not like a stringent enforcement. It was like, okay, you can submit your code and uh, we strongly suggest you to submit your code at least by the camera ready deadline. So in uh, here you see that most of the like the academia submitted their code uh, in the initial submission phase, whereas in industry the submission in the initial phase was not there, but still the industry like caught up to it during the camera ready submission. And on your right you see the graph where uh, like how many initial submissions turned from yes to uh, like no to yes. So essentially a lot of papers did accompany the code during a camera ready deadline. So this is all due to the different code submission policies. Now, does the checklist affect the acceptance rate? This is a very uh, in interesting question. And as of now, no, we do not have statistical significance that a checklist does accept, uh, affect it. But reviewers, we found that reviewers who found the checklist useful gave higher scores. So we asked like how many reviewers did find the checklist useful and 34% of the reviewers responded that they found it useful. And within them, we found that there is a tendency to give higher scores to the uh, papers that faithfully report the checklist. So this is quite interesting. And uh, we, we are hopeful that given in the following years, the checklist will be taken like more and more importance, both for people who are submitting their papers as well as reviewers. So you can read more about our uh, checklist and the statistical analysis in 
the reproducibility program uh, report that we published on archive. I will share the links in Slack or in uh, Q&A later on. So another checklist came up last year, and this is very exciting. This is a checklist from uh, Papers with Code, and uh, it was introduced by Robert Stojnik. And this is called as the ML Code Complete List Checklist. So this checklist gives you like a nice uh, set of instructions that you should add in your readme while you're open sourcing your code. Now, these instructions consist of number one dependencies, like what are the libraries that your code depends on, then explicit training scripts, where which are the scripts that I can run to replicate the training, which are the evaluation scripts that I can run to replicate the evaluation. Also, it suggests to release the pre-trained models of your, basically of your checkpoints of your uh, individual uh, results. And then finally, the results actually like the checklist uh, says that you should include a table or a plot directly in the readme so that people can easily refer to it. So they did a, like a nice study with this uh, set of five criteria using NeurIPS 2019 uh, repositories. And they found that repositories which has all of these five criteria met had a median of 196.5 GitHub stars. So that is really, really significant number. And that shows that if you do follow these checklists, your research will be more uh, widely applicable to a lot of people and a lot of people will use it in their own work. So uh, yeah, so next I come to the uh, code submission policies that were used uh, in the machine learning uh, field. So recently in ICML 2019 and Neurist 2019, uh, community have rolled out an explicit code submission policy. So there are many concerns in the code submission policy regarding data set confidentiality, proprietary software, and so on. So basically like when the code submission policy was uh, given out, it was written that, we, uh, that it expects code only for accepted papers and only by camera ready deadline. But then there was a lot of like backlash because uh, like, for example, in case of data set confidentiality, a lot of industry uh, like researchers says that their data set, they cannot like release it. And that is specifically in case of medical imaging. But uh, if that is the case, then one workaround is to like provide complementary empirical results on open source benchmarks. And that would probably add to more value of your work. Then proprietary software is like a common, uh, like common claim for industry researchers as well. But in that case, we suggest that if you are in industry, uh, you can also like provide some minimal code base, which, uh, which might not have the same training, but that has the similar uh, like expected results on a small benchmark. So that would help a lot, like that would help the community a lot. Because if you remember, like there's a lot of papers came out like BERT and GPT-3, but still uh, the community ended up replicating them using their own code within weeks and months. So it's uh, like having a proprietary code out, uh, like not the proprietary code, but rather a simple version of your code out, it would be very helpful for the community. So this graph I show is that how many papers are basically uh, re uh, releasing with their code. So in NeurIPS 2017, we started anal analyzing this and we had like 37% of code shared. Whereas right now it, the, that number has reached to more than 75%, which is very encouraging. And this is what we want to like go towards that all conferences uh, should have like 100% code submi submitted. So finally, in the open science movement, uh, I want to talk about some uh, steps that we took uh, in terms of reproducibility challenges. So we introduced the ML reproducibility challenge in iClear 2018. So this challenge is essentially uh, very unique where given a set of papers that have been accepted or even papers that have been submitted to a conference, uh, you take those papers and then you try to like reproduce parts or full of the paper. And then you uh, essentially submit a report on how well or how bad your reproducibility uh, effort went. But again, reproducibility is not a binary issue. You cannot just ask like, okay, is this paper reproducible? Like that question is very difficult to answer because a paper consists of a lot of different moving parts. And that's why these kinds of challenges are important where uh, people can dive deep into different claims of the paper and try to extract if certain things are not reproducible, why they are not reproducible. And that helps to the 
uh, to the basically the information of the original paper. So the motivation of the challenge is not at all to be adversarial. The motivation of the challenge is to help the original authors improve their submissions. So starting from New York's 2019, we limited the paper list to the list of accepted papers because the accepted papers were uh, released uh, with 85% with their code. So those were used in the challenge. Now, how is the challenge uh, structured? So essentially, we start with the process of claiming a paper. So we want to encourage uh, people to work on different reproducibility uh, aspects of different papers. So basically, we want to increase the, like we want to broaden like how many papers are being considered. So we added like a claim, uh, like maximum claim list because in our initial uh, conferences, we found that people tend to replicate papers which are easy to do rather, uh, and that would like lead a lot of students like working on the same paper. Now, I should also like clarify on what is the, like what are the people who actually uh, work on these reproducibility challenges? So we see a lot of students working on it and a lot of uh, early career researchers working on it because this is a great way for students to quickly learn or quickly dive deep into the uh, machine learning, state-of-the-art machine learning literature. But also we see a lot of uh, contributions from industry as well. So we have also like divided into like three different tracks. So we have the baseline track where you can work on top of the baselines that are used in the paper because most of the times the baselines are not uh, like not studied at all. So you should like basically try to replicate the baselines and try to do ablation studies in them. Then a third one is to do ablation studies on the code that is given by the authors. So you take the same code, but then you uh, do ablation studies on different model components. You do hyperparameter searches, and that's how you uh, end up to learn more about the paper and also add to our understanding of the paper. And then finally, the hardest is the replication study, where uh, it is uh, where you take the you do not use the same code base as provided by the authors. You create the code from scratch, and that became like super challenging. And but we were very uh, glad to see that a lot of students were trying to do do this track and uh, that led to a lot of interesting uh, discussions and interesting outcomes and then the students or, or people who are working on it can submit their uh, work so in case of new rips 2019 we did the review process in open review and uh, open review helped us a lot to set up the different uh, like basically they created an entire different portal for us because that portal was tied to NeurIPS 2019 uh, accepted papers. So people who are reading through the accepted papers can easily link to the corresponding reproducibility challenge. So uh, I encourage you to like go to our open review website uh, to see the challenge, uh, like the reports, everything is public. And once the, like, the reviews are done, so we use the same pool of reviewers from NeurIPS. And luckily we had like a lot of reviewers so uh, thanks to them, we did like a thorough review of the reproducibility reports, and we ended up selecting 10 reports to be published in ReScience Journal. Now, we had like uh, more, 63 universities participating in the challenge and 10 institutions participating in the challenge, and we want to see these numbers grow. And we had five machine learning courses throughout the world who had like registered specifically like making mandatory this challenge as a part of their final project. If you are an instructor, like this is a great opportunity for you to uh, use this challenge as a final project because the timeline that we do, uh, we try to launch this challenge in fall so that by end of fall, your students can submit certain reproducibility reports. So we saw that 84 reports were submitted from 173 papers which are claimed and 10 of them were published. And we saw the highest uh, participation coming from McGill University in Canada, Brown University in the US, KTH, and then Indian Institute of in, uh, in University, Roorkee. So we are very glad to these, uh, uh, about these students and we uh, worked closely with them to get their uh, reports published, like whoever was selected in the top 10. And we want to like continue this trend. So, there is also related work in the community. Uh, Jesse Dodge has been working on EMNLP reproducibility. So EMNLP is a conference in natural language processing. 
and he did like a similar reproducibility challenge uh, with students of University of Washington in winter 2020. And it, it is very good to see that other uh, venues are opening up for reproducibility challenges. There has been a lot of workshops prior to this challenge in ICML uh, 2017, 2018, and 2019, authored by Rosemary Nan And all these workshops had the same objective of people to submit reproducibility reports and then disseminating on the reports. So this concludes the first part of my talk. So if you have uh, any questions, please feel free to ask now. Let's see, I think uh, we have a couple of questions. I think the, the first one, uh, do you wanna read it, Steve, since you also had a very similar question? Uh, where, where can I see the question? Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Kusuf, how are you going to do it? I mean, we can we can read the um, yeah, the Q and A things to you, or you can you can view them. But let me just like read this first one because I also wanted to generalize it a little bit. Uh, which machine learning architecture comes with the best for producibility? And I guess my generalization is more about like um, if you could expand into the different subfields of machine learning, which ones are sort of the most and least reproducible? And then yeah. are these related more to the cultures of the communities or like the stabilities of the methods? Are there interesting things that you've seen there? Yes. So yeah, that's a great question. And there is no definitive answer for that. So basically the way I see it, the, like the range of reproducibility varies actually with different subfields. So if you're looking at reinforcement learning, the problem is more severe there because of the uh, variation in the training in the environments. Whereas in terms of like computer vision or natural language processing, the, there is still issues, but it's not as deep as that. But still, like the like the variance of the models also like differ. If you ask about like what kind of models would be more reproducible, that's uh, that's a question that we really want an answer from. The like right now the notion is that if you are working on let's say a, like a large scale model, so let's say BERT or GPT three, like these models could have uh, like better reproducibility because they are actually working on a large data set but then that is not quantified anywhere. And it is very hard to quantify that because then you have to like run GPT-3 on your platform for like N number of runs, which is a huge, a huge costly operation. So uh, yeah, so there's not a definitive answer to which types of architectures are more reproducible. All I can say that uh, we, whenever we are reporting our own like model performance, we should give like a good uh, variance of how the different uh, model performance are working so that we get like a good uh, notion out of it. Okay, maybe I can ask uh, another question of my own. So, um, so you know, like at, at the end of the day, the research, the real contribution, the scholarly contribution of a uh, of a research is really the code, right? It's not the mm -hmm. um, it's not the description of the code, which is the paper. What are the challenges to actually enforcing a full submission of the code by every paper that gets published? Um, I mean, at main conferences, of course, but also at journals, and then having um, uh, some mechanism in place to uh, running that code to make sure that it actually reproduces what is reported in the in the paper. Yes. So thanks for the great question. Uh, there, there are like a lot of challenges that I uh, like a briefly covered on the code submission policy. So the major challenge is that in a lot of people from industry are not able to submit the same code because of uh, proprietary reasons. And also let's say in medical imaging, there's a lot of like data set restrictions. So if you are working, let's say right now, a lot of people are working on COVID imaging, you cannot publish those data sets, right? Because those are very sensitive patient information. So in these cases, the reproducibility takes a hit. So, and this, this is like this, occurs across all conferences, even in nature, when uh, like computational uh, medical scientists like publish their work, some of these works do not at all accompany with code and that raises a lot, lot of confusion. So one way to uh, mitigate this is that if you have a proprietary data set, that is fine. You can also like report uh, similar uh, like results on open source benchmarks. 
for example, if you are in the medical community, you can also report uh, like results on Chexpert, on uh, uh, other like chest X-ray images like pad chest and so on, which are uh, openly accessible so that uh, people can at least verify your claims on those data sets. Now, in terms of like reviewability, uh, that is like right now, we do not like, we, we, we do not stress to the reviewers that, okay, you have to like run the code as, as it is given, but we want to like move towards that. But then it is very difficult for uh, reviewers as well to set up the same code and same dependencies and so on. Some conferences, like especially in computational, uh, in computational medicine or even in computational neuroscience, people have uh, tried to advocate for Jupyter notebooks to be submitted alongside your code, which has a, like a nice property of uh, like replicability so that reviewers can just run the Jupyter notebooks. But that is more feasible if your training doesn't include like machine learning training. Like if your training is just can be done on CPU, then you can done, do that. In case of machine learning, that becomes more challenging, but these days there are other solutions available such as Google Colab or even CodeOcean where you can get like GPU uh, tied to the Jupyter notebooks that you can use for submitting your work as well as easy reviewing for the reviewers. Thank you. I think, uh, yeah, I, I, like my question essentially like was for a summary of what you already described, yeah. Um, I think we have many, many other questions, but most of them, as I see them, are um, uh, will probably be answered in the second part of your talk. So maybe I'll let you finish your talk and then we can come back to some of these questions. Okay, awesome. So, yeah. So till now, we have, uh, like, I was basically looking into the problems in the community, but now I want to talk about, like, how can you perform reproducible research? So uh, this, uh, this will follow basically a talk and also I will release a blog post. So I have already released the blog post. I will like share with you guys after the talk so that you can go into the different uh, suggested practices. So let's say you start with a simple example. Uh, let's say you have an awesome research idea involving transfer learning on MNIST data set where transfer learning uh, involves like learning from one task and generalizing to the next and you are very excited about setting up this project. You, uh, you have like looked into the prior research and you are just starting to code. So you start with the basics. Now in this talk, I'm uh, assuming that you're working with PyTorch, but you do not have to work on that. You can work with TensorFlow as well. So let's say you set up like data loaders, you set up training loop, you set up test loop, and now you are running the experiments. But soon you figure out that you have too many arguments in your training. Like you have so many different model arguments and these model arguments like kind of increase as, as you're uh, progressing in your research. So what you can do about it, because if you miss certain arguments, then you have to like add those arguments as a default in your arg parse. So uh, there, there is a lot of like nice tools available. Uh, one of the tools that I recommend very much is PyTorch Lightning that helps in maintaining the different uh, uh, configurations that you run. So basically it creates a copy of the configurations in CSV files so that you can uh, refer to that from when you last run your code. But still maintaining this long set of arguments is trickier in my opinion. So for an easy management of config, uh, you can use like config files instead of argument parsers. So config files can be either uh, JSON or YAML files. I personally prefer YAML because there you can add comments and uh, you can like have this arbitrary large number of configuration files and you can like easily run like large scale experiments using these configuration files because now running your code is as simple as just mentioning uh, like the name of the config file. Now, I want to like plug certain uh, libraries. So uh, there is this nice library known as Hydra. So you should check it out. And Hydra also con contains another library known as Omega Conf. So these two libraries like together gives you uh, like a really big power over using config files because there you can use like uh, inheritance in your config files, which is very useful. So let's say you have a sample config file of your basic uh, arguments. And th then based on your different experiments, you just like inherit that config file and just modify 
certain values that you want to ins inspect in your current experiment. So that gives you like a really nice uh, leverage of uh, maintaining config files. And the important thing is you should also release these config files in your open source code so that people replicate uh, using them. Now, uh, okay, so you have set up your code, you are doing inference, and ideally you basically first infer on your validation set to improve your model. And finally, when you're about to write your paper, you should evaluate on your held out test set. But for this script, you also need to like save your model and you need to save your best checkpoints. So the next practice involves effective checkpointing. So ideally you should save as much as your resources permit, but then resources come scarce, especially uh, in uh, HPCs when you are given like a small amount of uh, data limit to work on. So in these cases, it's uh, best to save the last epoch as well as the best performing epoch. So you should have like some validation metric based on, on which you determine which training checkpoint is the best performing epoch and you save your model, you save your config files. Even people try to save a copy of their code, which enables like greater uh, reproducibility if you want to like go backwards in time. So if your model fails, you can load from a previous checkpoint. And this example that I'm showing is this is how PyTorch Lightning does. So PyTorch Lightning uh, is a nice experiment management uh, library, which uh, basically uh, writes checkpoints based on the epoch number. And you can also modify it to write based on the validation performance. So that gives you like, okay, this is the checkpoint that I will, I should use. Now, okay, so now you have good checkpoints available, but your model doesn't seem to give you a uh, good scores. So how does the, how does the training look like? And maybe you need to check the training logs. So the next uh, practice is logging. Now this is very important in terms of reproducibility. So you should log all your features while training and evaluation. Now uh, features include like validation metrics and training uh, metrics to log. Now, Ideally, you, you can also save your logs in like in file system in a log file. So you can use like Python logging module, which you can like redirect to save on a file, but then you have to do a lot of manual work while doing the, uh, this kind of logging, because whenever you want to see certain validation uh, results, you have to like search and grep through your log file. So instead you can use logging services that are available and one of the earlier logging services that have been used is known as TensorBoard. And this is still like the most widely used in machine learning where TensorBoard gives you like a nice local uh, runtime of like a, basically a visualization where once you log your values, so logging is very simple. You just like log metrics and then this, uh, this TensorBoard will show you different metrics and different plots. Now there has been a lot of criticism of TensorBoard because the way you cannot like directly uh, interact with the different plots. So there has been other entrants in the field like weights and biases. So this is uh, like really a cool uh, platform where you can uh, check interactive uh, plots. You can go into interactive sessions of different hyperparameters and you can see which hyperparameters affect your training and learning. And also it helps to give you uh, like a large view of different plots. There are other uh, like different plotting uh, systems available like ML, Wisdom, MLflow. Now, a lot of people still prefer TensorBoard because it, you can uh, deploy it locally. Now the issue with uh, weights and biases and ML right now is that you cannot deploy locally, which might be a problem with industry people because these uh, systems tend to log a lot of information, like including your system resources. So that might be some proprietary information that you don't want uh, your uh, users to look into. So TensorBoard also launched a TensorBoard uh, like an online version these days. So it's, it's kind of a way to share quickly your results to your collaborators and that uploads your TensorBoard system to uh, Google servers. So you can take use of these uh, different logging platforms. Now, as I said, practices one and three incorporate like best experiment management practice. And I, uh, I, I highly recommend using PyTorch Lightning. So this is a very uh, like large growing community where they have like really, really best practices for 
uh, fast training, evaluation, validation, and they expose a lot of different loggers. They expose a lot of different ways to save and evaluate your models. And on the same uh, line, there has been like previous work from Sacred. So this has been used a lot in pre-machine learning era. And also there is MLflow, which is also like an experiment management toolkit. So if you want, if you do not want to set up these boilerplates, then you should use one of these platforms. Although if you are a PhD student, I would uh, recommend you to set up these platforms from scratch because that would give you like a greater control of what is happening. Once you understand what is happening and where, then you can easily like switch back to these uh, different uh, like uh, different things because these are, after all, these are not libraries, these are frameworks. So you have to essentially learn these frameworks and if some uh, like something changes in the frameworks later on, then you have also have to update your uh, your experiments for it. Cool. So now all is good, but something is still odd. So when you run multiple runs of your experiment, it shows like different results. So that means you might have forgot to set the seed. And we have shown previously that this is a huge uh, problem in reinforcement learning research. So before running the experiment, I recommend you to like basically draw n number of seeds. So it's ideal to use five seeds, but depending on your computation budget, you can also use three seeds. And uh, so you take aside these five seeds, you keep them stored and you never touch it. And this is where you report your uh, experiment results. So you should not optimize the seed. You should report on whatever seed that you have taken. And you should also like report those seeds in your paper as well as in your code. So ideally you should average on different seeds for to help readers understand what is the model variance. Now I have given a simple snippet of like, if you are using PyTorch, how to uh, set your seed properly. Uh, there, there is other like snippets available to do the same in TensorFlow. Now you also need to uh, keep an eye out for GPU reproducibility because that is something that is not uh, ensured by even PyTorch team because of like, CUDA uh, reproducibility issues. So you just need to like take care of that. And uh, PyTorch like recommends these, uh, these APIs to call to set your uh, seed. So this is uh, probably like the most important part in rep uh, reproducibility of your work. So, okay, but wait, I forgot what did I do to make this work? Like I did a lot of work in my research, but I, I do not remember like what I did last night while being a caffeinated that worked this morning. So I cannot like tell it to my supervisor, okay, what is happening? So what should you do? So the next practice is the most obvious is uh, versioning your code. And you should always like start with uh, Git, uh, setting up a Git repository. But the key thing is that you should commit early and you should commit often. And you should also add descriptive commit messages. So in machine learning, what you can do, you can add the raw results directly in the commit message that you can say that, okay, I ran this experiment and this experiment gave me this, this result. Now you should commit early and you should commit every time you're running an experiment. And that is important because otherwise you won't have like exact reproducibility from one time point previous. And that will help you to maintain like sanity in your large project. So as a example, I show you like a commit message from the Hugging Face repository. And they have like really, really nice way to like uh, commit uh, different, uh, like different functionalities that they are adding to this uh, repository. Now this is an open source repository, so they have to maintain these standards. You do not have to do necessarily all of these things, but at least for your own sake, you can add in as more descriptive uh, information as possible. So GitHub is your friend. You should also tag versions of your project on, on major decisions in your project. So let's say you want to like uh, incorporate a new model architecture. You want to incorporate a new training architecture. So prior to that, you should tag the versions with the experiment results. And uh, you should have like a separate branch for small proof of concept. So essentially you can uh, use GitHub to its full potential. Okay, so now the next thing which a lot of people kind of like tend to overlook is when let's you have to mind your data or the data sets that you're using. 
So let's say in the transfer learning setup, you decided it would be a good idea to mix certain classes of fashion MNIST and MNIST digits together. Fashion MNIST is another data set where instead of handwritten digits, you have like small uh, images of like uh, cloth clothing, different types of clothing and bags and so on. So now you went a little bit too deep in this rabbit hole and you ended up creating many, many different data splits. And finally, you are not uh, you're not sure which data split you are using and you probably could have also overwritten one of your data splits So you're not getting the same performance So you should also keep track of your data and this is practice number six The easiest way to keep track of your data is to add it to a git version system Now due to the large size, it's sometimes not feasible. You can look into git LFS So this is a large file system for git where you can add your data sets but even more simpler thing to do is that you can compute a hash. So basically like a MD5 hash of your data set and you can add it to your config file. And every time you run, you should like validate using this hash so that you are not running on a different split of the data set or you probably have not changed something in your data set. So this is some easy things that you can try, but also, you should uh, back up your data periodically using Google Drive or AWS S3 buckets. Now, there is also a recent entrant uh, called Data Version Control or DVC, which is kind of like a Git for data sets where you can add in your data and it will give you a nice way to track your data as well. So uh, data tracking is very important. If you are releasing your own data, you should also consider adding a data sheet. Now, data sheet is very important and you should, I encourage you to read this paper, data sheets for data set, where the authors propose to add like a readme for the data set, which contains uh, stuff like motivation, composition of the data set, what is the collection process, what is the pre-processing used, what are the use cases of this data set, and how would this data set be distributed and maintained. So these are very important points that uh, you should have if you are releasing your own data set. Cool. So now you have done your experiments and you have like really shiny plots. You show it to your supervisor and your supervisor is like, hmm, okay, I don't like this plot. Give me another plot. So you run back and then you replot again. But then after a certain number of weeks, you cannot find your plotting code again. So that happens a lot. And the, you essentially don't care about the plotting scripts too much because once your training is done, you are like, okay, I'm done with it. But that's not the case. You should also like keep track of your plotting, your tables and everything. So why? Uh, because that helps you a lot in terms of like paper uh, production in, in, in terms of like submitting your paper and also doing camera ready. So the best thing to do is maintain notebooks. So you can maintain uh, like a set of Jupyter notebooks in a separate folder in your code where you should maintain separate notebooks for data analysis, result analysis, plot generation and table generation. Why? Because this will help you a lot because when let's say you get some reviewer comments and you want to update certain plots, but you don't want to like update the other plots, you can just run your plotting cells and that's it. Now you should add these uh, notebooks to GitHub and GitHub also like renders the notebooks in line. So you can like share your intermediate results with your peers and your collaborators. Now you can also like supercharge the existing Jupyter notebooks by using Jupyter contrib extensions. So this gives you a lot of like uh, powerful tools from collapsing cells to collapsing headers to uh, like TOCs and everything. You can also uh, want to like share your results using Colab, like Google Collaboratory, which gives you like a GPU and TPU runtimes. And you can also uh, use Binder to, which is another service which uh, gives you like Jupyter notebooks associated with a virtual machine. When you need to update the results on your paper, you can also like access, uh, like rerun the cells and you can use something like paper mill API so that the notebooks, uh, like you can run your notebooks in a different set of parameters from the original notebooks. So all of these like uh, tools, you don't have to worry about it. I will like, I have written everything in my blog post and I will share it in the end of this talk. And also another point that if you are uh, like maintaining tables, uh, pandas have this nice API to latex, which I use a lot. And that gives me like a nice latex tables to my uh, experiments without having to like 
copying the results hand uh, like in my hand to the paper so the next practice is reporting the results so you should always try to report the results with proper error bars so as i said that in uh, like there's a problem of like seeds so you should not run grid search on your set of seeds so as i mentioned you set aside a set of seeds and you basically run your model on top of it again and again and that gives you a nice variance in the results so obviously it, it would be much better if your model has less variance but i would advocate you to not to worry about it even if your model has large variance because that will add to the understanding of your model and that would add to faithfully report how uh, how your model performs so even if you are reporting your table you should like mention uh, like the confidence intervals and different variants in your paper now i define like different criteria one criteria could be like multiple seed another like higher bar of reproducibility is multiple data sets so you can also report your results as a variance on multiple data sets and that would be like a super higher bar of reproducibility or of generalization and even if your model has larger variance on different data sets it would be still encouraged to report them because then people will have a better understanding of how your model is working cool so okay lot of practices we just have three more left bear with me so practice number 9 is managing dependencies and this is very important irreproducibility often stem stems from software deprecation so basically to replicate a published work the first thing to do is to mash the same development environment the uh, and containing the same libraries and the, that the program expects thus it is crucial to document the libraries and their versions you use in your experiments after the, your experiments are stable you should leverage pip or conda uh, to like collect the requirements in a file and you should like add it in your repository now you when you use python like this is a nice way to uh, keep track of the different libraries but there could be other factors affecting as well so it would be even better to use like docker or singularity containers so these are like virtual machines which uh, basically you can upload your docker file and your singularity file to like a service and then that would be like easily reproducible with the same exact environments now let's say you do not like you did not have worked on docker like starting from your training because training on docker is a bit trickier you have to use nvidia docker and then you have to run on systems which support it a lot of hpcs do not support docker from the fly they support singularity instead so you can use like something like repo to docker so repo to docker you can use it to convert your existing repository in a docker format and then you can change it and you can uh, use your uh, like you, you can release that docker environment to the public so that they can easily replicate uh, your results so managing uh, dependencies is very crucial then uh, comes the next practice of open sourcing your research so after your paper is released you should consider uh, open sourcing your work now this adds uh, visibility to your paper and this encourages reproducible research and uh, this this is very uh, important because you can uh, like this is basically the hallmark of reproducibility if you have like a good well documented code alongside your paper like everyone will love it and everyone will basically work on top of it and that will give you more citations on on like in that regard so there is a like a great service coming up which is like papers with code and in this service you can list your uh, like code in the paper and so that people have like more uh, visibility of your uh, like released code now before you release code there are some pre release checklists that i want to uh, like mention so basically i talked a lot about like maintaining different commits for your research but then those commits are are, are especially for you to read and for you to understand where you did certain changes now the way we do research is very messy we tend to like just fix small things we say fix this bug or oh, oh no this is not working and stuff like that but these commit messages when it becomes public it might become like a a bad thing for the people to read so it's ideal to squash your commits in the public branch to a single commit before you make your repository public so that helps you to remove the unwanted commits and it also helps you to like remove 
any sensitive information that you might have in your commits. So you should also make sure that your code doesn't contain any API keys. So if you are using like uh, like weights and biases and commit ML, a lot of times we forget that our API keys are still in the code. So you have to like remove them uh, before uh, releasing your code. So you also need to keep an eye out for hard coded file locations so that people uh, can uh, run your code in a separate environment. You should also format your code properly to improve readability. So you can use something like black. So it's a Python formatter, which formats your code in a nice readable way. So you can just like black all your code at once. Like you can just run black then star, which includes all your codes and then it would format them in a really nice way. And the final part, very important is to document your code. So you should add like documentation as much as you can. I know it's, it's, it gets a bit uh, difficult to do all of these things at once, but as much as you can in your uh, libraries and your function calls, and especially it would be great if you add like tensor dimensions in your input and output of your function. So that will help like machine learning community to understand, okay, what this is the tensors that are going in and coming out of this function. So practice 11 is effective communication with readme. So once you release your repository, you should also like add these information from the machine learning code completeness checklist in your readme such that your uh, repository gets a lot of stars and a lot of uh, publicity. And it's only not only about publicity, like people can easily uh, replicate the results if you have like already shown in the, in, in the readme. It's also really good to have like a contributing guide so that if people want to contribute to your project, they can, they know what to work on and how to work on. And these days it's also really important to release a blog post surrounding your paper, which is kind of like an informal document where you talk about different things that you work on in your paper. And uh, these days, like just for publicity, people also like post their paper and code in Twitter. And because a lot of like academic researchers uh, like discuss stuff in Twitter these days, that's also a good way for effective communication. So cool. So I'm at my last practice and it has been a lot, but uh, th these are very important practices. And the last one is also very important is to test and validate your setup in a different machine. So as I said that you have to take care of your hard coded parts and your dependencies and everything, but the best way to ensure that everything is working is that if you use Google Cloud or AWS or Azure to spawn up a small environment, and then you just test the inference of your model or just training one epoch of your model. So that would give you a good sense of like how uh, your model is working, uh, like whether there is certain like issues in the hard coding of paths or certain like dependencies that you haven't uh, mentioned. So yeah, these are all uh, 12 practices that I basically wanted to talk about. And uh, the key takeaways of this talk is that reproducibility in machine learning is extremely important for the advancement of the field. And the ML community is coming up with innovative ways to encourage reproducibility. But we all should commit to reproducible research early on in our workflow so that we uh, don't have to like worry about our work being not reproducible. Like the more effort you give upfront, the better it is for downstream reproducibility. So I also will release a blog post, like it's already online in my website, uh, csmegill.ca slash tilde. So there's a tilde uh, case in her four. So this is essentially my Megill username and practices for reproducibility. So I will like share it in the Slack and also in the question answering session. So this is essentially a complimentary blog post to this entire talk. So in the blog post, you will find all the tools that are necessary or you may want to use for your, uh, for the best practices. Now, finally, to conclude, I want to mention uh, like this nice uh, phrase used by my supervisor, Joel Pinu at New Rips 2018, is that science is not a competitive sport. Like we tend to like look into it in that way. Like we tend to try to beat other models by posting better models and try to beat certain baselines, certain leaderboards and so on. But science is not about only uh, beating certain baselines or certain models. It's about deeply analyzing what is happening and how we are advancing the field. So 
we should all take care about our work and we should give enough time and enough care to our research. I understand that due to uh, different incentives, like due to the incentive of pub publishing faster or the incentive to like uh, get your results out, like before you get scooped, these things tend to get like not uh, looked upon. But if you uh, care about your work and then you should like devote more time to it, the more time you devote to these issues, the better your work will be longstanding and the better like down the line, people will find your work to be very suitable. So thanks so much for listening to this talk. Uh, thanks to Joel, Afinu, Shagun Sodhani, Jessica Ford, Matthew Muckley and Michela Paganini from Facebook AI Research to help me out in uh, making this talk and giving different uh, suggestions. And thanks to uh, the hosts of this seminar for giving me the opportunity to talk. And thanks to uh, all these people who have been involved in reproducibility challenge, in re-science, in building the checklist, and especially open review guys who have been very helpful in uh, setting up the platform. So thank you for listening and time for questions. Thank you, Gustav. This was uh, really a great talk. I mean, uh, it's a tour de force of all the things that are related to reproducibility in practice. Uh, I, I certainly learned a lot. Um, uh, we have, I, I think we have many questions. Um, several of them have been answered, I think, in the second part of your talk. But um, okay. let me let me see. Let me, let's go through a few of them. They are at le different levels. So the first one is, is the, is the reproducibility challenge still open to work on? Yes. So that's a great question. So the, we will again relaunch the reproducibility challenge uh, in New Rips 2020. So right now, uh, like tomorrow, New Rips is going to announce the reviews for New Rips 2020. But the final paper acceptance will be released somewhere in end of September or early October. So that is exactly when we will launch our, uh, like our reproducibility challenge and it will continue towards end of December to early January so that you have enough time to work on it. And if you are in university, I would uh, encourage you to like contact your supervisors or professors beforehand so that they can like make it uh, like a general uh, thing to participate in your course. And we also like list the courses that are participating in our website so that everyone can have like a good visibility of which courses and which institutes are more uh, interested in this problem. Uh, another question is, which of these practices are in your opinion, opinion the hardest to adopt? Right. So. I think the like the hardest practice for all of these would be uh, managing proper dependencies and managing the uh, like uh, setting the correct seed. So managing proper dependencies is hard because if you are uh, like software deprecation is a real issue. So let's say if you train on like PyTorch uh, 0 0.9 and then uh, the people like upgrade to PyTorch 1.5, then certain things might not work. So you have to like mention explicitly like which of the libraries that you are using. And uh, it would be really ideal to like share these uh, singularity or Docker containers, but that's a kind of a lot of work for people to do. So that's why these uh, repo to Docker, like these services come up or binder or collab, these services come up. Now in case of like maintaining seeds, so that is kind of like a, that, like a different problem. The problem is that if you are trying to show that your contribution is significant. It, if you like set certain seeds early on and you see that your model is not performing well, you will have the urge to change those seeds. And that is where the difficulty comes up. So you should, you should restrain yourself and you should say that, okay, I'm not gonna change the seeds because uh, like that would be kind of like a fair assessment <laughs> of like uh, reproducibility if you just keep your seeds aside and then you report whatever you are working. So you should focus on model improvements on those seeds that you have like set aside on. So I would probably like term these two practices as being uh, most difficult, but I'm sure like these are not that difficult if you are like careful about it. Okay. 
Um, uh, there is a, I think a question is a general, like more of an opinion question, um, uh, yeah. asking for your opinion. So it says, it says like publishing trained models means uh, posting binary data. GitHub like repos are not well suited for such purpose. Is there a YouTube like repo for massive binary data archives? Mm -hmm. Who will pay for such massive publicly available storage? Right. So that's a great question. Uh, so to answer that, like, uh, so PyTorch team has released this PyTorch hub where you can upload your uh, trained models to work on. And uh, otherwise, if uh, like the storage is an issue, uh, uh, you can like store it to AWS S3. So AWS S3, you can store in a long term archival format that will lead to very cheap uh, like resource usage. So it's still a bit costly, but if you are like coming from a, like an industry or a lab, you're, you should like get your lab to fund it out. And AWS S3 in long-term storage is cheap enough. Otherwise, what I do personally, I just like upload the model uh, checkpoints in my Google Drive, but essentially I pay for the drive. So uh, that's one issue that students have to face where uh, they want to like uh, publish these, uh, these model binaries. So yeah, you should like, kind of like work it out with your supervisor for a nice uh, like option. A lot of labs do have like a common, uh, like an enterprise Google Drive, which you can use to share these model binaries. A question on the seeds. I think also there's another opinion question. So uh, training yep. a model across different seeds is a nice idea, but can be computationally intensive. Yep. Yep. As a student, what steps can I take to compensate for the lack of massive compute? Yes. So as a student, what you can do is you can uh, take, uh, take help of like HPCs. So if you are a student in Canada, you have access to Compute Canada. So that is like a huge resource for all students studying in Canada where you can take access to uh, like a huge array of GPUs. If you are in US, uh, they, they don't have a Compute Canada like setup, but there exist a lot of different uh, like training HPCs from different institutions where you can apply with your project proposal and take use of it. But yes, for sure, I agree that if you are like a student from a, like a lab which do not have all these GPU resources in hand, reproducibility gets a lot difficult. So in that case, probably the major focus is not to work on like problems that require a lot of scalability. Instead of looking into problems that are more uh, like more analysis driven or that require a lot deeper thinking of the different uh, architectures. So, so to give you an example, like uh, it's very costly to train a BERT or transformer type language models, but it's easy to infer them. And that uh, like led to like a large subfield of using probing tasks where probing tasks are simple linear models that you train on top of your language model to, uh, to see whether your language model is learning these syntactical or semantic uh, like cues. So these types of research fields like come up on uh, basically, uh, and these are some of, there's a lot of exciting research areas that you can work on, which do not need to like, where you do not need to like scale up this much. For example, in reinforcement learning, most of the like fundamental work can be shown in smaller environments which could be like easily run in your own uh, lab setup. So uh, yeah, so that's kind of like my suggestion. Thank you. Um, uh, another question is, does regularization have a positive effect on reproducibility? Yes, yes. So regularization has a uh, like a really good effect on reproducibility and a lot of papers, uh, they tend not to focus on it. So uh, like, for example, if you can uh, propose a model, which is like, uh, which is a very fancy model, but then you can use the, like you can use regularization on your baseline to show that the baseline is in fact better than your proposed model. So we should be also like looking into that. So recently there, there is a, like a nice paper which came up where, uh, like people showed that you can train an um, MLP to replicate the CNN uh, architecture by using L1 regularization. And uh, these, uh, these are like really important findings. And so you have to like keep this in mind while proposing a new work. And that's why it is very in important to first evaluate the baseline. So if you, 
evaluate the baselines thoroughly by using all these regularization techniques or ablations, then you will know exactly where your contribution fits in. Maybe uh, another question on uh, on like how to get more of this. Uh, the question is, do you think there will be an open source courseware that teaches researchers pedag pedagogically how to structure projects to encapsulate all these techniques of reducibility, that this is useful mm -hmm. for people outside of ML too? Yes. So uh, when I, I actually looked into this problem and I found one Coursera course that is available for uh, reproducibility, but that course I felt was a bit limited in content. So it would be great if uh, the community like comes up with a, like a reproducibility course. As far as I know, like uh, my supervisor plans to do the course sometime uh, in McGill. So I will ask her again. So, so once uh, she has like all the necessary uh, like setup, then she can probably like take this course. And uh, to, to mention another course, like there has been, uh, in in uh, the, 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 there was a course which looked into the effective machine learning training pipelines like that was a more undergraduate uh, level course i think that was in mit i i have to like look for the course uh, name but there are like several courses which are coming up and that would be really great to at least like teach students early on how to adhere to these uh, different practices Thank you again, Gustav. I think there are several other questions, but um, uh, maybe uh, uh, they can be taken on Slack. Uh, yep. um, if the attendees wants to follow up with their questions on Slack, that would be great. Sure, sure. Um, yeah. I, Gustav, I, thank you again for, for this great talk and uh, um, yeah, the many resources. I'm looking forward to reading your blog post. I think yep. some of the attendees already said that they are uh, they're there and they're reading it. Um, yeah, and um, uh, thanks for everyone for joining the, uh, the lecture today. Um, next week will be a break, and then after that we will have a, uh, a lecture on um, uh, uncertainty quantification in deep learning. And so I hope that you join us then, and until then, please be safe. And, thanks uh, for the opportunity, and uh, yeah. glad to give the talk. Thank you, Gustav. Thank you so much. Thanks, Costa. And thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.